Hello and welcome to the seminar on EU production standards for agri-food products. My name is Maria Arana and I work for the Spanish Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. In today's session we will talk about the EU phytosanitary system and the plant health law. Just to provide a bit of context, I think it's important to mention that the European Union is not a homogeneous region. As a matter of fact, it includes a wide array of landscapes and ecosystems that could be uh, organized in larger uh, geographical areas called biogeographical regions, depending on the vegetation that occurs naturally, naturally on them and uh, the sharing of certain ecological traits. As a result, we can find nine different biogeographical regions in the European Union, as you can see outlined here in the map on this slide, that range from the Atlantic region on the northwest, the boreal region in the north, the continental region, uh, marking green in the, in the center, the Mediterranean region, the Macaronesian, the Pannonian, the Stepic, and the Black Sea region. All this biogeographical variability allows for a um, broad range of crops. And thus we find that in the European Union, we can uh, find productions of forage plants, fruits and vegetables, grains, oleaginous seeds and fruits, olive oil, potatoes, just to name uh, some of the most relevant. But along with this broad range of products also comes a broad range of local pests, be it insects, bacteria, viruses, whose movement across the territory of the European Union may pose a phytosanitary risk. This is particularly relevant in the context of the single market of the European Union. Since 1993, the EU allows the free movement of capital, labor, goods and services. And the resulting trading bloc has seen a great increase in the volume of trade. But the increased volume of trade also means an increasing likelihood of the spreading of harmful organisms. In addition to this, there are also other threats to plant health, such as the globalization of trade and climate change. So in order to fight all these uh, threats, the European Union has established rules to determine the phytosanitary risks posed by any harmful organism and also has set measures to reduce such risks to an acceptable level. So, how does the EU ensure the safety of its plant and plant products? Well, the strategy of the European Union is based on three main action lines. First, the pest categorization with the associated concept of regionalization. Then, the control on the internal movement of plant and plant products. Uh, it also has uh, tools to assist him in that uh, respect, like the plant passport, the common health entry document for plant products, the CHED-PP, the Eurofit outbreaks alert system. And then it, has, uh, it exerts control on external trade, both by uh, applying controls and checks on the goods that are going to be imported into the European Union, as to the export controls that applies to the products that are leaving the European Union and are uh, going to a third country. Let's uh, talk a little bit more detail about the first element, the pest categorization. Here you have schematic representation of the hierarchy of pests for the European Union. On top of it, there are the priority pests. These are a subset of a broader category, the EU quarantine pests. The European Union defines a pest as a quarantine pest within or with respect to a defined territory when it fulfills all of the following conditions. The identity of the pest is established, the pest is not present in the territory, or if it's present, it's not widely uh, distributed. The pest is capable of entering, uh, dis establishing and spreading through this territory or part of it. Uh, the entry, the establishment and the spread of the pest uh, would represent an unacceptable social, environmental and economic impact on that territory. 
And last but not least, there are feasible and effective measures available to prevent the entry, the establishment and the spread of that pest. And also, there are measures available to mitigate the risk of that pest. The quarantine pests are all listed in the so-called Union Quarantine Pest List. And Union Quarantine Pests shall not be introduced, moved within, held, multiplied or released in the Union territory. In case a quarantine pest is detected within the EU territory, eradication measures should be adopted. That may include the creation of demarcated zones with their relevant infested zones and buffer zones, and the adoption of whatever actions uh, professional operators or other stakeholders may put in place in order to eradicate the quarantine pest. Going back to priority pests, as we said, they are a subset of the uh, European Union quarantine pests. And th those are pests whose potential economic, environmental or social impact is most severe. So in order to allow efforts for the control of Union quarantine pests to concentrate on these ones, a restricted list of such pests, priority pests, is established. The last group would be the uh, Union regulated non-quarantine pests. These are uh, disqualified or these are pests that qualify as such if they fulfill a set of characteristics, which are that the identity of the pest is established, that it is present in the Union territory, but it is not categorized as a quarantine pest. It is transmitted mainly through plants for planting. The presence of that pest in those plants for planting would represent an unacceptable economic risk. And again, there are feasible and effective measures available to prevent the, the presence of this pest in the plants for planting. So, professional operators shall not introduce these union-regulated non-quarantine pests or move the pests within the union territory on the plants for planting through which this pest is transmitted. Moving on, we can uh, talk a little bit about regionalization. Regionalization provides additional protection to geographical areas against non-present harmful organisms. Protected zone quarantine pests are established with the aim to prevent the spread of harmful organisms. When a quarantine pest is present in the Union territory, but it's not present in a member state of the EU, um, and it is not a union quarantine pest, then the European Commission may recognize such territory as a protected zone in regard to that quarantine pest. So, a protected zone quarantine pest shall not be introduced, moved within, held, multiplied or released in the respective protected zone. So protected zones are geographical areas in which one or more harmful organisms that may be established or not in the rest of the Union are not known to occur in spite existing favorable conditions for the establishment of such pests. Also, in terms of internal movement, if you remember a couple of slides earlier, we talked about uh, the tools that the European Union has put in place in order to control the internal movement of plants and plant products. And one of them that was mentioned was the plant passport. A plant passport is an official label for the movements of plants within the Union territory and were applicable within protected zones. This plant passport, what it does is to attest compliance with all the requirements set out in the legislation for the movement into and within protected zones. The plant, the plant products and other objects for which a plant passport is required are listed in a different piece of legislation, which is Regulation 2072 of the year 2019. Also, the European Union establishes a ban of movement for certain plants within the territory of the Union 
or in protected zones unless these plants have a plant passport attached that is valid for the territory concerned. On top of what we have already explained, there are other actions that member states can uh, take in order to avoid the spread of EU priority pests. These are surveys, contingency plans, simulation exercises and action plans. In terms of surveys, there are different types. We have surveys for priority pests. These should be done annually and they must include a high enough number of visual examinations, sampling and testing in order to ensure the timely detection of priority pests. There are other types of surveys in order to detect the presence of other quarantine plants for the European Union or potentially quarantine plants. In the terms of contingency plans, these are separate plans that must uh, contain information regarding the decision-making processes, the procedures and the protocols to be followed and the minimum resources to be made available in case uh, there is the presence of a priority pest. Also, we have the simulation exercises. These are drills and they relate to the implementation of the aforementioned contingency plans. Uh, it's important that the simulation exercises are uh, set for a reasonable period of time and they require the involvement of all the stakeholders. Finally, we have the action plans. Where the presence of a priority pest is officially confirmed in the territory of a member state, then the competent authority must immediately adopt an action plan. This plan needs to set out the measures for the eradication of that pest and also it has to provide a time schedule for the application of those measures. So the action plan shall include a description of the design and organization of the surveys, the number of visual examinations and the samples that are to be taken and the laboratory testing, as well as the methodology that is going to be used for the examination, the sampling and the testing. In regard to outbreaks, when uh, there is an outbreak of a disease, a member state shall notify the European Commission and other member states where its competent authority officially confirms any of the following situations. When there is the presence in its territory of a union quarantine pest not known to be present there, and the presence of a union quarantine pest in a part of its territory where it was previously not present. Then, the Standing Committee on Plant Health must conduct a risk assessment. And based on that risk assessment, the European Commission will set out measures against specific union quarantine pests. Those measures shall implement specifically for each of the pests concerned one or more of the following provisions. The measures that professional operators have to take immediately, the measures for the eradication of the quarantine pests, the establishment of the marketed areas, the surveys and modification of the marketed areas and contingency plans. I think it's worth uh, speaking in a little bit more detail about the European Union contingency plans. As we've said before, they are separate plans that they have to outline uh, what are going to be the decisions to be made, what resources are at our disposal, what is going to be done. So these plans include the measures to be taken against the introduction of priority pests and in the case of pests already present, they need to outline how to act swiftly and effectively in order to determine the spread of the pest. Each contingency plan shall include the following. The measures to be taken concerning the provision of information to the Commission and the other member states and the professional operators, the arrangements for the recording of the findings of the presence of the priority pest in question, any assessment made by the member state in regard to the risk that that priority pest uh, poses for the territory, 
the risk management measures that are to be taken in regards to the priority pest and the procedures that are going to be followed, the principles for the geographical demarcation of the demarcated uh, uh, zones, and the protocols describing the methods for visual examination, sampling, and laboratory testing. Moving on to the uh, next element, which is the control on external trade. As you remember, the European Union applies controls to the goods to be imported into its territory and also controls to uh, products that are going to leave the EU territory and going to the third countries. So it applies import controls and export controls. Going into the safety of the imports, what is important to mention is that on 14th of December 2019, the new plant health regime of the European Union came into force. This represents a departure from the former approach of the European Union to plant health in the sense that from now on, all products, plant products coming into the European Union must enter accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate. There is just a short list of uh, products who are exempt of coming accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate. Also, in the new plant health regime, there is a set of prohibited products. The prohibition might be permanent or temporary. If it's permanent, it's self-explanatory, those products cannot enter the territory of the European Union. If the prohibition is a temporary, however, then the exporting country uh, shall conduct a pest risk assessment, which, if it is found favorable, may allow for the entry of such products into the European Union, provided that they uh, fulfill a set of import requirements. In addition to this, the new plant health regime also sets out uh, some mandatory checks. Plants and plant products whose entry is allowed will now be accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate. Among these, we need to distinguish between those products that will require both identity and physical checks on 100% of cases and those who will undergo inspection on only 1% of instances. Finally, in terms of the exemptions that we have mentioned, just to indicate that the list of products that are exempt from entering the EU uh, with a PC is uh, extremely short. There are only five products. And these are the pineapple, the coconut, the dates, the durian, and the bananas. Uh, they are considered to be practically risk-free from a phytosanitary point of view. Once the plants have uh, passed the relevant border controls, then they will be presented or issued the Common Health Entry Document for Plants and Plant Products, the CHED PP. And this is a document that is going to accompany or is going to be attached to these products across all their movement through the European Union territory, from the point of entry to the final destination. This in terms of import controls. In terms of how does the European Union ensure the safety of the exports that is, the products that are going to leave the European Union and go to a third country. The first thing to note is that it's the responsibility of the exporter or the operator to know in full the import requirements of the third country. He must know them all and he must comply with all of them. So once that he is aware of them, then he, uh, this operator or the exporter must apply for a phytosanitary certificate to the NPPO of the member state. The NPPO, in turn, will carry out a set of checks, a set of inspections, a documentary check, an identity check, and a physical check. If the NPPO is satisfied with the result of those inspections and encounters or finds that they are all in compliance with the import requirements set by the third set by the third country, then they will issue the corresponding phytosanitary certificate. The phytosanitary certificate that accompanies these exports shall be issued 
when the information available allows the competent authority to certify compliant of the plant or the plant product with the phytosanitary import requirements of the third country. There are several sources where we can find this information that then will be reflected on the phytosanitary certificate. Some examples of information sources are the inspections, the sampling and the testing, the official information on the pest status, uh, the information may come from a plant passport, they also may come from the boot markings of the boot packaging material, and also from the information included in pre-export certificates, or may come from the official information that is included in the phytosanitary certificate where plants, plant products, or other objects have been introduced into the Union territory from a third country. When it comes to phytosanitary certificates, to issuing them, also the NPPOs of the European Union comply with International Plant Protection Convention standards, in this case ISPM 12, phytosanitary certificates. Phytosanitary certificates are therefore issued to attest that plants, plant products or other regulated articles meet the phytosanitary import requirements or of importing countries and they are in conformity with the certifying statement. The phytosanitary certificates might be issued for export or for re-export and phytosanitary certificates are issued only for these purposes in compliance with ISPM 12. Um, the European Union follows these international uh, plant protection convention standards and it takes into account when doing so the different types and formats of phytosanitary certificates and thus, as I've mentioned, differentiates between export certificates and re-export certificates and also sets a validity period for that certificate. It's important to mention that the phytosanitary security of consignments might be lost after issuance and therefore the MPPO of the exporting or re-exporting country may decide to restrict the duration of the validity of those certificates after issuance and prior to export. In addition, uh, NPPOs of the different member states within the uh, European Union also follow the guidelines uh, included in ISPM 12 and other international plant protection standards that apply in terms of how to produce electronic uh, certificates, certified copies, or how to conduct the replacement of phytosanitary certificates. And similarly, also follows these guidelines in terms of how to deem a phytosanitary certificate unacceptable or considering it invalid or when it comes to fraudulent alterations of certificates. Just to summarize, the European Union has in place a system, a certification system that follows the uh, International Plant Protection Convention standards, those are followed by the NPPOs of the different member states of the European Union. And with this, the European Union considers that their systems offer the necessary warranties that the exports are in full compliance with the import requirements of the country of destination. And with this, we have finished our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention today. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to submit it to the question and answer session that it will be afterwards. Thank you very much. Goodbye.